Following the Christ Child, Sunday, December 23rd, 1934. My friends, within a few hours we will be commemorating the birth of the Prince of Peace. Once more the Christian world will be re-echoing the sound which angel voices sounded above a lowly stable more than 1900 years ago. The Christian world, with the exception of Russia and Mexico, where a handful of atheistic communists regard the infant Christ as their sworn enemy. To this thought, the Mexican communism, I shall return, but it is more expedient that first I dwell for a few moments on the more pertinent thoughts associated with the birth of Christ. Fashioned after the image and likeness of God, man, under the Creator, was appointed master of this world. It was planned that all its creatures should serve him in an orderly fashion. Golden grain and fruit-laden orchards were destined to spread their abundance before him. In his vocabulary such words as disease and death were undefined and meaningless. Life, love, and a perfect natural happiness were bestowed upon him. His intellect was so fashioned that, easily and without error, it functioned to discover and grasp the multitudinous manifestations of truth which lay hidden in every flower, in the thunder and lightning, and between and beneath every grain of sand. His heart and his will were naturally inclined to love virtue and the beautiful things of life to such a degree that hate, unbridled ambition, greed, and war were foreign to man's desires. If I thus passingly refer to the wondrous days of Eden's garden, if I seem perchance to be an impractical poet lost in the dreams of things that might have been, it is only for the purpose of painting a background to the historical facts which eventually made their appearance upon the crimson canvas of life's realities. Despite his lack of scientific education, even an untutored citizen can read the story of the dim past. He is aware that, from time immemorial, life has been a bitter struggle. Instead of wheat and grapes there grew thorns and thistles. Instead of nature's willingly serving man, it buffeted him about with plagues and famines and devastating eruptions. Diseases multiplied, crime and hatred grew apace, feuds arose, intelligence became numbed, and the heart of man, cloaked in ignorance and steeped in selfishness, turned from God who created it unto the false gods of its own devisal. Read the story of the ancient civilizations, of the Medes and the Persians, of the Assyrians and Egyptians, of the Greeks and the Romans. It is a story of slavery and warfare, of famine and poverty. It is a sordid narrative of superstition, of darkness and of social decay. Man, who had been created to know, to love, and to serve, in liberty and in contentment, the God who created him, eventually was degraded either to the estate of a galley slave, or to the base quality of an overtaxed colonist. Ignorant of the meaning of life, of government and of religion, the dictatorial monarchs of Rome established themselves as owners and proprietors of life. Caesar became a veritable god. Poor sons of fallen Adam, though you knew it not, you whose souls had been immortalized at the touch of the divinity, you into whose bodies there had been poured the lustral drop of eternity, you were nothing more than the vassals and serfs of the Prince of Darkness, the ruler of death. Thus, if one fact is crystal clear in all the pages of history, it is man's failure to succeed in life independent of God and God's truths. The further man strayed from him, the deeper he became mired in slavery. 
During the thousands of years of man's degradation, one small nation remained more or less faithful to the precepts of the Creator. I refer to the Jewish people. Constantly they prayed that God would send to the world a Redeemer as He had promised. Constantly they were reminded, through the words of their prophets, of the Messiah's identity. His ancestry was foretold, the place of his birth was designated, the singular fact that he was destined to be conceived by a virgin mother was emphasized. To make sure that the Redeemer would be recognized, not only the outstanding incidents of his life, but his peculiar death and his divine resurrection were specified. These revelations, most likely, were known to the high priests at Herod's court who, when questioned by the wise men from the east as to the place of the Messiah's birth, knew that Bethlehem of Judea was the city where the miracle of miracles was to occur. My friends, if time permitted, I should dwell at length upon this divine birth. But, in the exigencies of our present day, it is more important that I attempt to interpret it for our political consideration. First, however, let me pause to make public profession of my Christian faith in the mystery which surrounds this feast of the first Christmas. I believe that an unfortunate man was incapable of redeeming himself from the degraded slavery into which he had fallen. I believe that out of the depths of his love, Almighty God freely sent to us his divine Son, the second person of the most blessed Trinity, to redeem us by his death from eternal punishments and by his life and doctrines to teach us how to avoid social and spiritual ruin. I believe that Jesus Christ, who was cradled at Bethlehem, was conceived of a virgin mother by the power and operation of the Holy Ghost, and not through the agency of natural wedlock. I believe that Jesus Christ possessed a perfect human nature, intellect, will, memory, imagination, every faculty even as you and I possess them, but in a perfect degree. I believe that he also possessed the perfect divine nature, all-powerful, all-wise, all-good, all-just, all-merciful. He was infinite in every respect. I believe that both his human nature and his divine nature were united miraculously in one divine person in such a manner that every human action which he performed was credited to his divine personality. This, at least in part, is my religion. These are my fundamental beliefs as, with you and the shepherds and the wise men, I worship in simple faith at the shrine of Bethlehem's manger. I am so convinced of these basic truths and rely so much upon them that I regard Christmas not only as the feast day of the Savior's birth, but as the birthday of our freedom from darkness, from error, from slavery, and from sin. Without Christmas, Pagan civilization, which reached both its peaks and its depths under the Caesars, would long since have spent itself. Men by this time would have returned to an age of Gothic barbarianism, which would have carried with them the vices of Rome. In another sense, Christmas is the beginning of the world's most far-reaching revolution. At the heart of our Lord's birth, the Roman state finally had arrived at the point of decay where, legally, the last trace of real religion had been destroyed. Briefly, I mean that it is the occasion when Caesar Augustus declared to call himself a god. This was the day when, by imperial decree, he forced the people of his empire to regard him as such. 
This was the very moment when he was ordering a new census of his citizens, believing that, like so many cattle, they belonged to the state, that children and their parents, robbed of all opportunity to worship the true God, must sacrifice their human rights to him and, like all other state possessions, be identified with this new God's private property rights. The creature had usurped the throne of the Creator. Despite these fine phrases which have been coined to eulogize Augustus and his golden age, here was the lowest degree to which civilization had fallen. It was at this moment that Christ was born. It was at this hour when the angel's song of peace on earth and to and of good will announced the battle cry of the new revolution a revolution in favor of truth over falsehood of liberty over slavery of religion over atheism long enough had the truth been trodden down long enough had slavery ruled Long enough had wicked men attempted to play the part of God by teaching and practicing that the citizens belonged to the state and that the circlet of divinity belonged to the ruler of the state. My friends, neither Augustus nor his contemporaries realized that it is the pejorative of God to vanquish those who persecute him to conquer at the moment when he appears to be abandoned by all. These days of the counter-revolution had come to an end, guided by the star of Bethlehem, the wise men from the east desert, the foolishness of Pythagoras and the pagans, shepherds representing the agricultural class, hasten to the crib to carry away with them a vivid picture of the truth made flesh, the laboring class, represented by Joseph, the carpenter, stands guard over the divine infant and his mother suckles him at her virgin breast. Here is the birthday of a new civilization when its first royal family will defy the wiles of a murderous Herod and the pride of a swollen Augustus, preferring to flee into an Egyptian exile rather than to submit to a physical death in Palestine or to a spiritual death, if it were possible, at Rome. After twenty centuries of history and vicissitudes, through the grace and teachings of Christ the Savior, mankind has fought its way back from the valley of state despotism and despair. Civilization did not perish, faintly at first, then with thunderous acclaim there was preached the sanctity of the family, the brotherhood of man, the divinity of Christ, and the fatherhood of God. What, though these preachments were interrupted by Judas and his ecclesiastical successors, or by a Vespasian, a Caesar Borgia, a Cromwell and their political progeny, nevertheless, the torch of truth which was lighted by Bethlehem's star continued to burn. The winds of human passion never succeeded in extinguishing the reborn doctrines that a human state or government exists for the people, that citizens are not chattels, that men and women are sons and daughters of God. Hand in hand with the spreading of Bethlehem's story came universities and schools. Science was developed. Culture was extended to all classes. Christianity was a success, though Christians oftentimes were its greatest foes. Christians who wore the triple tiara of Alexander the Sixth, or who held the gilded scepter of Henry the Eighth. But the revolution born at Bethlehem never faltered. Freedom slowly but surely conquered as long as kings and parliaments, 
presidents and congresses, together with their people, held fast to the story of Bethlehem. From the ancient days of Pythagoras, centuries before the birth of Christ, there was a heresy handed down to posterity. It teaches that man is the measure of all things. It implies that God has no business interfering in the morals, in the government, or in the actions of men. Man is the measure of all things is the pagan theory which, followed to its logical conclusion, makes individualists out of all of us and gods out of the most relentless, the most unscrupulous. It is rugged, very rugged individualism. It is this doctrine that sustains Caesar Augustus. It is the same doctrine that gave the disciples of Karl Marx courage to utter their blasphemy that would not rest until they dragged the false god from his heaven. It is the doctrine of the present-day counter-revolutionists who pale with anger at the mention of Bethlehem. It is the principle of modern communism and of modern capitalism. It is the beginning and end of the policy which today we are encouraging officially in our relations with Mexico. Of this I shall speak. I could tell you the story of Mexico. I could rehearse its rise and fall before the white man ever placed foot on her shores. When the Spaniards came with their first missionaries to bring the story of Bethlehem, they encountered a pagan people steeped in the grim religious rites that sacrificed thousands of human beings to their pagan gods. Or I could recall for you the history of Spanish progress in our neighboring southern republic, its university that preceded Harvard by nearly a century, its schools, its hospitals and houses of providence, which have bespoken the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. I could unfold for you the story of Mexico as it was before the day of American intrigue. Then slavery was unknown. Then there was Christian peace and civil concord until our own President Polk began to implant the system of human slavery in a sister nation that believed in human brotherhood. But I hasten down throughout the years of the Mexican War when we coined the phrase Manifest Destiny, a phrase similar to the German slogan of A Place in the Sun, a place in the sun, no matter if it were achieved through the philosophy that might is right. That was the pagan philosophy upon which we Americans rested our justification for our war of aggression against Mexico. In that day we plotted and planned the so-called independence of Texas. We stooped to steal Lower California from the Mexicans. We pillaged and robbed a peaceful people. All these things are hidden facts of history carefully related in textbooks which are printed beyond our own borders and graphically told in that classic novel Ramona, which was popular when I was a small boy. In our own time, to the lasting disgrace of his name, came Woodrow Wilson bearing in his heart the same greed for gain which motivated the former presidents Polk and Buchanan. Woodrow Wilson, with his avowals of democratic freedom and his practices of plutocratic plunder, I associate his name with that of Mexico because of his attitude, because of his policies which were practiced almost at the moment when the vast lakes of oil were discovered south of the Rio Grande in 1912, two years before Wilson's election to the presidency. 
It was found that the wealth of Mexico was associated not with her silver mines, but with her hidden lakes of liquid gold which, because of the trivial barricade of an international boundary line, were barred from the Americans at the minimum price of plunder. Backed by the elements of intolerance and motivated by men of greed, we Americans, through our president, unloosed in that year of 1812 and the decade to follow a diabolical propaganda which, through the columns of the press, fired the imagination of the American youth and the gullible American laborer and agriculturist with the so-called tyranny and absolutism of President Diaz. Through intrigue, our secret ambassadors chose a Mr. Madero to head a revolution in Mexico. Madero proved to be an honest man, one desirous of honest elections and honest government. Because of this, Madero offended the Wilson cabinet. He had refused to promise a lease of Magdalena Bay and its lakes of oil in Lower California. At this juncture, Huerta, a just and great president for Mexico, took over the reins of government. This gentleman and his Mexican cabinet were fully recognized by England and Germany. Our own Am ambassador to Mexico recommended that the Wilson government also recognize him. This was the signal for Woodrow Wilson to go to work. He was determined to secure the oil leases of Mexico at any cost even at the cost of our national honor. Thus he raised the arms embargo in favor of two of this world's greatest scoundrels, Villa and Carranza, two Dillingers and murderous mobsters who were paid to devastate the peaceful hillsides and contented cities of Mexico. Fruitless were the warnings sent by our ambassador Sh honesty to his chief at Washington. The President of the United States was determined to arm these butchers who plundered churches, tortured priests, raped nuns, and dismembered Mexico limb from limb with the weapons of war which he, Woodrow Wilson, had sent to them. Then on April 21st, 1914, Josephus Daniels, at that time Secretary of the American Navy for the United States, ordered our Navy, at President Wilson's command, to seize the port of Veracruz, which was President Huerta's only channel for supplies of defense against the two Dillingers, Villa and Carranza. Thus, by armed intervention, Woodrow Wilson had placed the Butcher Carranza in the President's Chair of Mexico. It was Woodrow Wilson who muzzled the press of our nation. He stopped the entire story of this intrigue from being printed in the columns of the New York world. The same Wilson who, at a later date, was to expound to the world his fourteen points. The same Wilson who was to keep us out of war when, with that campaign slogan still on his lips, he was engineering us into the world war. The same Wilson who prated of people who were too proud to fight while he was in the act of arming and inciting revolutionists across the Mexican border. Wilson, the friend of small nations who waged battles for the freedom of peoples, the same Wilson who made the world safe for democracy while he was in the act of supporting anarchy and atheism against democracy, all for the greedy commercial dollar. Personally, I know a story which has not been chronicled in the pages of American history relative to President Wilson and the Mexican situation. Two great and distinguished Catholic bishops had been sentenced to death by Carranza. Certain of our 
influential American friends approached President Wilson to intervene and save their lives. President Wilson refused to do this. Then, approach was made by these same friends to Cecil Spring Rice, the ambassador to America from the court of St. James, England, asking him to befriend us in this hour of need. Cecil Spring Rice walked into the telephone, called the Japanese embassy, informed the Japanese ambassador of the necessity for immediate action. In less than six minutes, through the intervention of Japan, a pagan state, at the request of England's ambassador, the lives of the two bishops were saved when Wilson had refused to act. The gangsterism of Carranza was labeled liberalism in our press by Wilson. His agrarian brigandage was termed peon emancipation. His atheistic educational program was paraded as free teaching. When approached by the late Cardinal Gibbons to discuss his Mexican policy, President Wilson was forced to admit the enormity of Carranza's crimes against life and liberty and property. This pathological president was so intent on the rape of Mexico that he persuaded Congress to reverse itself on the Panama Canal tolls. He cajoled our Congress into taxing our um, own American ships for the use of our own canal to please England, in exchange for which England promised recognition of the revolutionary government of Carranza. Now, for the last chapter of American activities in ravaged Mexico, I am telling you these things on the eve of Christ's sacred birth because they are more pertinently associated with it than one would surmise. Coincident with Carranza's rule, or rather misrule of Mexico, there gradually arose to power the supreme dictator of our suffering sister republic. His name is spelled C A. L L E is. I shall purposefully mispronounce it and call it Callus. From Wilson to Roosevelt, Mexico has fallen the full depth into the slimy cesspool of barbarism. Mexico, with a population of approximately 15 million persons, 95% of whom are Catholics. Mexico, with a population of far less than one million organized communists, is today pleading on her knees and asking us in the name of the infant Christ, whom we revere at this moment, to have pity on her and cease associating ourselves with her crucifixion. Never in the heart of Africa could be found the savagery of Mexico's present government. Never in the history of the world, not excepting Russia, has there been a Christian land so despoiled. Word comes to me from France, from England, from every state in our union that masonry, free masonry, from Presidents Polk and Buchanan down to Presidents Wilson and Roosevelt is behind the scenes playing its hand to tear down the Catholic Church and destroy the Christian religion. This I cannot, this I do not believe. There is not an American Mason, free or fettered, who could devise the satanic fury in Mexico today. I have too many staunch friends in masonry to permit me to believe this. I know that masonry has, as its fundamental tenet, the belief in a supreme being, and I also know that the government of Mexico has as its first principle the tearing of God from the highest heavens. I will gladly join with the Freemasons of our nation to spike this lie. 
They will tell me it is the socialists who are to blame for the present Mexican disaster, but I tell you it is not the American socialists, at least whose political platform has been kind to the downtrodden of this nation. It is not religious bigotry, it is not partisan politics, it is simply Satan himself who could have excogitated this persecution, whose only origin could be hell and whose only operator could be callous. Let me be specific, callous is the dictator of Mexico. Cardenas is the recently installed president. A man by the name of Canabal is the governor of the province of Tabasco. It is this latter villain's philosophy of education, already in practice in the state over which he is governor, that has won for him the distinction under Callis of director of education for all Mexico. Remembering these names and these officers, let us gather our facts. On June 20th, 1934, Cardenas, the incumbent president, was placed in office at the command of Callas. On that day, Callas, the new dictator, began a new phase of his Mexican revolution which was expounded in a speech line he made to the people of all Mexico. From this speech I shall quote, we must enter into the consciences and take possession of them, the consciences of children and the consciences of youth, for the youth and the children must belong to the revolution. It is absolutely necessary to drag the enemy out of his trench. The conservatives are the enemy and their trench is education. Their trench is the school. It would be a grave and cowardly dereliction of duty not to snatch our youth from the claws of the clerics, from the claws of the conservatives. Unfortunately, the schools in many states and in the capital are directed by the clerics and reactionary elements. We cannot leave the future of this country, the future of the revolution, in enemy hands. With all their trickery, the clerics cry, The child belongs to the home, the youth belongs to the family. What egoistic doctrine! Children and youth, I say, belong to the community, to the collective body, and it is inescapable duty of the revolution to attack this section, to dispossess them of conscience, to uproot all prejudices, and to form a new national soul. For this end, I urge and extort all governments of the republic, all the authorities of the republic, all the revolutionary elements of the Republic that they give definite battle on whatsoever plane and to whatsoever limit in order that the consciences of the youth shall belong to the revolution. My friends, you have lived to hear both Lenin and Stalin outdone. Your ears have just been offended with the philosophical statement that is counter-revolutionary to the revolution instituted at the crib in Bethlehem's manger. Whether you realize it or not, you have learned that Caesar Augustus, without his refinements and culture, has become reincarnated in the person of one individual, one dozen Cromwells, a score of Neros, a battalion of Machiavellis walk the earth again in this Lucifer let loose from hell. Callis lied when he made this speech. As a matter of fact, there was not a cleric in all Mexico with freedom, not one Catholic priest for more than 50,000 laypersons, not a Catholic school open in all Mexico. But Callis was inaugurating the most astounding educational program in all history. To operate it, only teachers dyed red in atheism were admitted. 
As the little boys and girls walked daily to their classrooms, they saw printed in a large type upon the blackboard the sentence, There is no God. That is their first principle. Their second principle is the age-old companion of atheism, the satanic, but nevertheless the psychological fact that through sins of sexuality even a child can be led away from his god. Therefore, these atheistic communists have adopted the principle that sex knowledge and sex practices must be inculcated early into the hearts and bodies of the virgin boys and girls. Turn your minds from the manger of Bethlehem. Come, look with me into the Mexican Revolutionary School, the same school which Woodrow Wilson fathered when he paved the way for its functioning by lifting the embargo on arms and by making Mexico safe for the communists, the same school which Josephus Daniels helped to establish when he sent in the American Navy to Veracruz, blush not, for in your mind's eye you will see little children stripped naked, little children of both sexes not only taught to examine themselves but taught by public performance in the classroom how to commit copulation with each other. I could hardly blame you for stopping up your ears when I tell you, upon my word of honor, that in these revolutionary schools, supported today by the Mexican government, sexual perversion is openly practiced and encouraged. As the little boys and girls leave the schools, they are supplied with free tickets with which to gain entrance to lewd and licentious moving pictures. Object lessons in procreation of the human race are followed by trips to maternity hospitals where the mysteries of childbirth are studied. But natural and unnatural sins against the flesh are not sufficient for this curriculum. Callus's program is determined to enslave the conscience and the soul of the child. Furthering such enslavement, the governor of Tabasco struck upon a brilliant idea. Cannibal, the governor, ran a livestock exhibition. He summoned all the school teachers and the pupils from the surrounding countryside. He exhibited the bulls, the stallions, and boars in sexual actions. Then, with his judges, he picked the prize winners. The prize bull was labeled God. The prize animals of other species he named the saints of God. This was only in keeping with his policy of naming his own sons, three of them, Lenin, Lucifer, and Satan. This is the man who is the director of education for Mexico, and those are his practices. Callis so praised the work of his director of education for making brothels of the schools that he has given him complete charge over all Mexico. To his shame and everlasting dishonor, this same callous openly maintains that this program of bestial education, which enslaves the bodies and minds and the souls of the children, this program which desecrates this Christmas, which is the feast day of the Christ child, is done in the name of Freemasonry and in the name of socialism. This, I repeat, is hard for any American to believe. Indeed, every member of the Masonic Orders in America can gladly call upon the members of the National Union for Social Justice to help them choke this lie down Callis's dastardly throat. Moreover, no socialist who ever followed the honest Debs or the decent and highly intelligent Norman Thomas can suffer the slimy slur cast upon him by this unregenerate beast. But we do know, my friends, 
that the crimes against the holy childhood of Mexico, the sodomy that cries to heaven for vengeance, are by his public utterances seconded and praised by no less a character than the former secretary of the navy under Woodrow Wilson, now the American ambassador to Mexico under President Roosevelt. I refer to Josephus Daniels. We have positive proof that complaints have been sent to the Secretary of State and to the President himself relative to Josephus Daniels seconding and abetting the educational program in Mexico. Up to date, we have not had the honor of an answer. We do know that there is a tradition in this nation known as the Monroe Doctrine which, for a century or more, has specified that, in the spirit of our founder, Washington, we shall refrain from European entanglements and shall expect European nations to, in to refrain from interfering in Central and South America. Another scrap of paper. For Russia is operating at this hour and on this Christmas Eve south of the Rio Grande, teaching and preaching that Bethlehem's story is a myth. Moscow is here. The League of the Godless is encroaching while we sit idly by with a wicked complacency, fearing to offend the dictator Callis, lest the American oil operators lose a concession or that the doctrine of neighborliness suffer a setback. The government of the United States, from Woodrow Wilson down to our President Roosevelt, has aided and abetted the rape of Mexico. It was Wilson who ran the guns for the mobsters, and it was his man, Josephus Daniels, who won the dirtiest revolution this world has ever known. As in the days of Herod, the wise men from America were interviewed and asked to seek out the child so that our oil barons could come and adore him. In their hearts, the only adoration they knew was the adoration of the dollar. It is under President Roosevelt that Josephus Daniels, who before the visiting school teachers in Mexico, praised its educational systems, which I have been forced, in the name of decency and in the name of the lover of little children, to describe to you today. Now let me quote Callus again. We must now enter into and take possession of the minds of the children, the minds of the young, because they do belong and should belong to the revolution. Having heard the atheistic dictator of Mexico, let me quote the hero of Vera Cruz, Ambassador Daniels. The spirit of the Mexico of today was clearly and succinctly stated last week in Guadalajara by General Callis in as brief a sentence as that employed by Jefferson decades ago. General Callis, speaking for the ear of all patriotic Mexicans, and particularly those entrusted with leadership, said, We must enter into and take possession of the mind of the childhood, the mind of youth. To the carrying out of this aim, which alone we can give Mexico the high place envisioned by the statesmen, the government is making the rural school a social institution. Here, my friends, you have heard Daniels come to judgment. The American ambassador, in parrot language, repeats the blasphemy of Callus and practically tells the 95% Christian population of Mexico that the Americans are communists and haters of Christ. It is in the name of social justice, in the name of the little children of Mexico, as well as the little children in our own nation, that I speak to you today against communistic atheism, which in no sense is a real revolution, but which in every sense is a counter-revolution leading back to slavery and to the Neros. Purposefully, I have saved the first principle of our 16 points for this day, which is dedicated to the Christ child. 
freedom of religion, freedom in education, because the child does not belong to the state. Its mind and its heart and its soul belong to God, its creator, and were entrusted by him to the father and to the mother. What is happening in our back can happen in our backyard. Therefore, Protestant, Jew, and Catholic have all united in one common saying, Remove this blot on our fair name. Remove from office one who aids and abets this atheistic communism. We Americans will have no part in the socialization of children of this nation, nor will we participate in the desecration of the sanctity of their innocent consciences. History is replete with evidence that the world has not succeeded in getting along without God, and history is mindful of the shining star of Bethlehem, which illuminated the darkest night in this world's life. We are through with counter-revolutions of communism and atheism. We stand by Christ and the Christ child. His is the path which leads to progress, to prosperity, and to happy eternity. The path of counter-revolutionist leads to barbarism, to slavery, and to a Herod's hell. Christmas Day is empty and vain unless we resolve to teach and practice the principles advocated by Jesus Christ. It is worse than vain unless we have courage to say to that diabolical fiend, callous, and to remind those who are responsible for our bungling, compromising Ambassador Daniels that whoever shall scandalize one of these little ones, it were better that a millstone be fastened about his neck and he be cast into the depths of the sea. Christmas is the feast of the little ones. May God grant that it remain so here in America, and that it may become so among the children on the other side of the Rio Grande. From the curator of this channel, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. God bless you.